Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Acts chapter 15 once again. Last time we started down through this chapter as the leaders, the apostles, and the ones that the Lord had raised up as leaders for his church gathered in Jerusalem for a very important meeting. And the issue, a very important one, to be considered is mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 15, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So is that a vital issue or not? I would say it's the most important thing that needs to be answered. And so in verse 2 it says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem, they were in Antioch, unto the apostles and elders about this question. And so this is what's vital. This is important. So what began, as we see in verse 2, in dispute, and not just, this was not a discussion as to what color the carpet should be or how big we should have our meeting places, but this was over how is it God saves sinners? By his grace alone, or is it grace plus anything? And so in the midst of this dispute, we find, first of all, Peter standing up and speaking. And I saw that last time that the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. When there had been much disputing, you can see all the way down through here, disputing, discussion, much debate back and forth. You might say, well, what was wrong with them? Didn't they have the scriptures? Well, they had the Old Testament scriptures. But what we're reading now in the New Testament, we benefit from these having plainly made this issue clear, final and definitive. If there were any group of people today that said, well, let's have a conference and discuss whether salvation is by grace alone or it's grace plus. I'd have to say, you're wasting your time. Just go back here and read what has already been determined by God himself in his word. And so we saw where Peter spoke. He rose. And you say, well, why Peter? Why was he so impressed to speak? Well, it's that... Even he, at one point, had struggled with this question. He was raised a Jew. Such was the segregation. In fact, when the Lord, in a vision, directed him to go speak to Cornelius, who was a Gentile, he objected. And even to the point of saying, I've never touched anything unclean, when in that vision it was those unclean meats that the Lord brought down in a sheet and told him to eat. And the Lord told him, don't call him pure, what I've made pure, declared pure. And he's talking about this distinction. Is there today any distinction made for certain groups of people with regard to how God is pleased to save them? And the answer is no, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, it doesn't matter. There is one way of salvation. And that is in, through, and by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. There's none one above the other. And so this was a great issue. And even so today, where there's a divide, because people have these scriptures, and yet to believe, you know, most people, they, they cannot believe this message apart from the Spirit of God revealing it. They're always going to argue. They're always going to debate it. They're always going to say, yes, it's Christ, but it's the combination of your believing plus what he did that brings salvation. Wrong. It's not what this is saying. Nothing that we do can add to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be made right with God. But sadly, and there's people that have this same Bible that consider themselves to be fundamental believers that will say Christ has done all he can and so the grace of God is there for the taking, but you've got to take it. I say that that's just as wrong as these that said, but 
It's fine, Christ did it all, but you still have to be circumcised. Or you're still required to obey the Ten Commandments in order to gain or maintain salvation. That's not what the scriptures teach. So I would say that this question is just as vital today as it always has been. And that is that how is it that sinners are saved? Well, the conclusion of Peter here. As, as we saw last time in verse 8, God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. What witness did he give? Well, look in verse 7. Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking there about Cornelius and his family. But notice how he puts it here, which to me shows that the Spirit of God had truly taught him. Because in verse 8, he puts them before us. In other words, the Gentiles, even before him as a Jew. Because he says, giving them the Holy Ghost. So in that, he's given these Gentiles the prominence, even as he did unto us. He's taken the second place here. He didn't say, just as he's given unto us, so now he's given unto them. No, it's just the opposite. Preferring one above the other. And he says there in verse 9, purifying their, he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Wherever you see faith, put Christ. By the persuasion that salvation is in by through the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the faith. Once delivered unto the saints, that's that one message from the beginning of time to the end of time. That salvation is in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. In the Old Testament, all the way back there in the garden, when God took off the fig leaves and clothed Adam and Eve with the skins, that was a picture of imputed righteousness through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the foundation was laid, and the fulfillment of it was when Christ came, but... It's the same faith. The purifying of the hearts by faith is how the Spirit of God takes that message of Christ, reveals it in this heart, and grants that persuasion. See, faith is a persuasion. It's not a preference. We can't walk away from this and say, well, you believe however you want to, and we'll believe how we know. That's how it's divided up today. Oh, you're one of those grace people. Well, what other kind are there? other than being saved in by and through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. His finished work there at Calvary. That's the faith to which Abraham looked. David, they looked forward to the promise, the fulfilling of these things in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now some might think then that the Old Testament message was different than the New, and that somehow... When we come into the new, now God is beginning to include the Gentiles. But the truth is, as we're going to see here, as James stands up to speak, that it's always been God's purpose to save the Gentile even as the Jew. Even though if in the Old Testament, the primary work of God was among and through that Jewish nation, yet it was not to the exclusion of the Gentiles. In fact, Paul, in writing to the Romans, addressing these Jews, he asked that important question. Was Abraham a Jew? Was he circumcised when God called him? Nay, he was an uncircumcised idolater living up in Syria. And here they are, the Jews saying, well, we have Abraham as our father. Well, guess what? Abraham wasn't a Jew when the Lord called him. And drew him. He was an uncircumcised idolater, flat on his face, before these that you consider your enemies and won't have anything to do with this. You're a Jew. So we need to be reminded of those things. Even us today, having been raised under this gospel message and hearing it right now, we dare not in any way look down our nose at some of these others that are still in religious idolatry and think, huh, we're better than they are. No. I dare say every one of us listening right now, we were born into this religion of idolatry. It took God by his grace, teaching us of Christ, 
and turning our hearts to Him. That's what it is to have the heart purified by faith, by this persuasion, by Christ. That's why I say if you have trouble understanding faith in Scripture, just put the sin in Christ next to it and you can never go wrong. Read it that way. By grace are ye saved through faith, through Christ. And that's the gift of God, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. So here's Peter that now is speaking as to how the Lord had taught him in all of this disputation. And he comes to that conclusion in verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? In other words, to take any other position is to fly in the face of God himself and his clear revelation, somehow making a distinction between sinners and thinking one better than the other. And he adds to it to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers, and he includes himself, nor we were able to bear. That's why when I hear a preacher say, you know, it's true, we're saved by Christ, but you got to go back and obey those Ten Commandments. I want to ask him, you know, how's that working for you? Because no one was able to bear up under that yoke. In fact, the scriptures are clear. The law was never given as a means of salvation. It was given only to bring more light to the desperate, lost, condemned state of those sinners. And any time that anybody got a little more prideful, God just brought more light, added more law. To reveal all the more the desperate nature of their sinfulness. And so he says in verse 11, but we believe. See, there's that persuasion. It's not a preference. He's not saying, well, I, I prefer that we see it this way, and hopefully we can take a vote with majority winning. There's no vote given here at the end. It's either this way or it's not. We believe. We are persuaded that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. No distinction. There's not one message for the Jew and another for the Gentile. I've been into many different countries throughout the world, but I've never had to wonder what I have to preach when I go into it. I may not understand the language. I have to have an interpreter speak for me. I've traveled many, many countries over the years and preached this gospel. But as the Lord has taught me, in every land, in every situation, no matter what the language, it is this message of Christ and Him crucified. And what a joy it is to hear them as the Lord turns their hearts to express back, even in their language, how it is the Lord has been pleased to teach them. I love to, when someone speaks, I love to ask an interpreter, what did they just say? And to hear them say they're rejoicing. In this message of Christ. It's not Ken making it plain. It's the Spirit of God that purifying the heart by faith, by Christ being revealed, and the Lord maintaining and keeping these, even though they're separated one from another, and don't have the privilege of meeting together in one place. That's reserved for glory. When around the throne of the Lamb, people from every tribe, nation, <coughs> and tongue there's not going to be any debate and argument as to how they got there. They're going to be singing one thing. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And if any of us is looking to any kind of tradition or personal works in here or something that we feel ourselves better because of even our belief, then we're desperately in darkness and blindness. It's only in by and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Now, here's the part, because the, this message is entitled Gospel Unanimity. You don't have to try to get people to agree in the gospel or on the message of Christ. Here, I love this in verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence. That's the work of the Lord. Through the testimony of Peter, pointing these to Christ, all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. As Barnabas and Paul declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought with them among the Gentiles. How do you know when one is truly listening, truly hearing? 
They're not talking. They're not talking over you. As the Lord is pleased to cause this gospel to go forth, he's the one that brings the unity and the oneness of heart and mind in those that he teaches by his spirit. You don't have to come to an agreement. You don't have to meet to try to come up with some watered down statement to which everybody can agree. That's the problem with these declarations of faith that you have today in these different congregations. They, they want as many in as possible. So you read them and, and the statements are so watered down that anybody really could sign and say, yeah, I'm a believer. But the very distinctive aspects of God's word and his gospel, wherein you find those clearly stated, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of people saying, oh, no, no, that's, we, we can't have that. That excludes too many. We're trying to get in as many as we can, not exclude. Talk about the matter of God's sovereignty. State it plainly. Don't say simply, well, God's in control. And so put it that way. Don't say, like some of these, we, we don't want to be saying that he actually has made a choice as to who he saves and who he condemns, and he's the one that determines that. You'll see a lot of watered-down confessions of faith from different congregations, and on this point even of who God is. It's so watered down, there's no punch to it. It's a perversion of God and who he is, a sovereign God, saving whom he will and condemning whom he will. Make a clear statement even on the will of man that his will has nothing to do with him contributing to or enhancing in any way that salvation which is in by and through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. I'll tell you, you want to fight, take man's will out of it. But we'd have to say the same thing, not even circumcision, not even man's will. Paul said it so plainly in Galatians, which the letters that they went around and delivered to all of the churches based on this meeting here. The epistle of Paul to the Galatians grew out of this. The Lord so impressed Paul that this needed to be emphasized and made plain all the more. Whenever you think that you have made the gospel as plain as you think possible, repeat it again and keep stating it. I'll tell you, it's the best way to sort out the wheat from the chaff, the goats from the, the sheep where Paul said, if righteousness come by law, in Galatians 2.21, in any way, any personal obedience to the law, any work of the law, he said, Christ is dead in vain. You have made the work of Christ a none of faith. That's how strong this matter was. And so here, the multitude gives silence. You know why I believe that God has ordained it through the preaching of the gospel and not the discussion of the gospel, that he's pleased to deliver sinners, bring them to Christ. It's because it's the one time where everybody has to sit quiet. Now, they might not be agreeing with you while you're preaching, but at least they have to be quiet long enough to listen. And then afterward, they'll let you know, you know, and then you can say, well, at least you heard. But here, I believe as we read on, this was a silence and a giving audience that wasn't just a natural silence. I don't know if you've ever watched from the Middle East some of the debates between different sides. I, I recommend sometime even watching what goes on in, in the Knesset. There's all kinds of arguing back and forth and going on how they're going to rule, what they're going to say. But when these can be brought to silence, being in their nature to dispute and to debate, and now they're sitting quiet, having heard not only Peter's testimony, but now Barnabas and Paul, when he talks about the miracles and wonders of God. Remember that the New Testament had not yet been written. Paul wasn't traveling around with a copy of the New Testament like we have today. That was over time that this was written. So God purposed that those miracles and wonders that accompanied their message, it was designed to confirm exactly what they were preaching, that salvation is not in and by and through our personal obedience, 
to the law, but the obedience of one, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he used that here in verse 12 to show the work that God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. See, Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the Jews. And yet here we find agreement. And as we study the scriptures, I don't care whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, because the Spirit of God has given us this word, it's his inspired word, there's going to be agreement. People like to try to find discrepancies in the word and say, what about this? I'll tell you, there's no disagreement from Moses all the way to John who wrote the last word. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. If for no other reason than that alone, it would be enough to show me that this truly is God's inspired word. Because all of these scriptures were written by 40 different writers over a period of 1,500 years years and yet they're all saying the same thing you're not going to find one error or one deviation from what moses declared to what john declared or even what peter and paul and barnabas here are declaring and it's that it's summed up in verse 11 like we saw last time we believe i don't care whether it's in the old testament or new that through the grace not just the grace of God. See, people like to water that down. Why don't we just say the grace of God and instead of saying the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? People will say, I can accept that. Just don't say the Lord Jesus Christ. Just don't call him God. We have those folk coming around our neighborhoods all the time, knocking on our door. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They use his name, but he's a created being. and God adopted him as, their, as his son, and now he's working through him. So they'll say you have to believe on him, but... He's not the same Christ. They like that word Jehovah as if it pertains to somebody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, to say Jehovah, which in our Bible is L-O-R-D, all caps, that's none other than the revelation of God the Father in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In every portion of Scripture in the Old Testament where you see that word Jehovah, that's the great I Am. That's what the Lord said when he was on this earth to those Pharisees who did not believe him to be God in the flesh. And again, Christ made it plain. He said even before Abraham was, he didn't say I was, he said I am. He's the, the one who, who was and is and is to come. And so Paul is declaring here and, and the miracles and wonders that accompanied that message were to show that indeed that Jesus of Nazareth is the God. There's no God of the Old Testament, God of the New. He is that, that one who was to come. And here's what I love, again, about verse 13. Once the Lord gets people quiet, they're quiet. Because it began up here where in the midst of all that disputing, now it says the multitude kept silence. And then verse 13, after they had held their peace. There's no debating here. It's the Lord by his spirit that is bringing that unity and oneness in the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord hasn't taught a sinner, there's no sense you and I arguing with him. That's just fleshly wisdom. But people want to say, no, well, let me go through this and explain it again. The problem isn't with the explaining, as I say. It's with the hearing. They will not hear unless the Spirit of God grants that peace. But as powerful and forceful as Paul's testimony and Barnabas' testimony and Peter's, see the scriptures say in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every truth be established. Now, verse 13 stands up James. He was the primary elder in the congregation in Jerusalem. It was from this particular congregation when it says there in the beginning that, that there were from Judea in verse 1 those that taught the brethren and said except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses ye cannot be saved. This was coming from James congregation. These were not preachers that were going out and adding to the very message of Christ. But what I find 
wonderful here is now James takes responsibility. He owns this as being something that could not continue. Now this James here was actually the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was, would have been Mary's son after Joseph had gone in together with him. But he did not use that particular position or relationship in any way to try to influence. In fact, he goes back to the word, same word we have, to express unto these gathered why it is that they should believe that salvation is by grace alone. And again, the only scriptures that they had were the same that Paul was using to preach. That's the Old Testament. And so that's where he goes. In verse 13, Jesus answered saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, that's an interesting way that he puts this, that God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people. James begins by insisting that God had a people among the Gentiles. So that's the first thing. Why are we even debating and arguing this? It's evident that God has a people among the Gentiles. This might amaze the religious Jews who, by their standards, if anybody wanted to be a part of the kingdom of God, then they had to literally become a Jew. They had to get circumcised, and then they had to start... It's like in a religion today. If you're going to join here, you got to start walking and talking like we do. If you came from a Methodist background, you got to learn what it is to be a Baptist. you got to learn what it is to be a Presbyterian. Or if you're going to come out of that dead religion over there amongst the Baptists, and you want to be amongst us, the Pentecostals, you, you got to get circumcised. you got to learn how to walk and talk. Religion is taught that way. It's spread that way in the world. But here, James specifically declares that God has always had a people among the Gentiles. See how plainly it's put? God had the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people. Now you can say, well, at the first, speaking back to when Peter first went to Cornelius, but I believe that James here, as we read on, actually is speaking back all the way in the beginning. When did God first visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people? Well, let's go back to Abraham, who was a Gentile. He wasn't even a Jew. Go back further to that and ask the question, was Adam even a Gentile? Was he? Jew, Jewish nation didn't even exist at that point. Anybody that came through him, if God was to deliver and call them out, it would be by his grace, calling out a people from among the Gentiles. That ancient Greek word used there in verse 14 for Gentiles, it could be translated nations. And if you look it up in, the, in your concordance, you'll see that it's actually the word from which we get the word ethnic or ethnicity. The ethnic ones. So that word for people, because he uses both. He uses Gentiles there in verse 14, and then he says, take out of them a people for his name's sake. That word is the word that people use the word laity today. Actually, it just means people. When you see clergy and laity, that's man's devising. There's no one above the other. You know, when people say, well, they're the clergy and we're the laity, well, what does that make them? God's? Somebody that came down, you know, and isn't among the people, of the people. So here, actually, it's with reason that James uses the vocabulary he does because that word people is typically a word that the Jews used of themselves to distinguish themselves from others. So you were either a Jew or you were 
of the world. You were of nations. You were Gentile. But look at it here how James uses it. Although they considered themselves to be a laos of God, a people of God, and never among the ethne, the Gentiles, for them the ethne and laos were contrasting words. You can't call one the same as the other, and yet that's exactly what James is doing. He himself being a Jew. So this was the challenge for them to hear that God had first visited the Gentiles, ethnic, to take out of them a people. What seemed to be to the natural ear of the Jews a paradox, in reality, James purposed that it should be used to show just how God, in his mercy and grace, has always purposed to have a people. And that name that they took for themselves actually pertained to the Gentile. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So with this is what he says there in verse 15. To this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. So here again we see where James is not standing up based upon his relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, well, you know, I'm... Christ's half-brother here, and so I've got some authority on this matter. That's not what he does. What does he do? Go back to the same scriptures that are inspired of God that we have today and to show that with these words, notice, of the prophets, agree. There's agreement among the scriptures, there's agreement among the prophets, and there's agreement among those that are the Lord's people when the Spirit of God is pleased to teach the heart. Just as it is written, is what it says. Well then, you see there what is written. And here he's going back actually to Amos chapter 9 and verses 11 and 12. How many of us honestly have read recently in the prophet Amos? That's one of those prophets that you think, well, I don't really know what I, that's all about. I think I'll just speed read through it. That's the scriptures, just like Peter on the day of Pentecost went back to Joel. Those are the forgotten prophets. In fact, people call them the minor prophets. I don't even know where that came from. There's no minor or major. It's because maybe the, the books that they wrote, the Lord caused them to write, are shorter perhaps than some of the others, but there's no difference. They're all saying the same thing. And what James here quotes, and you have to remember, they didn't have copies of the scriptures like I'm looking around now, we're all looking and we're turning back to Amos. And they, they didn't have copies. They were speaking, especially James here speaking as the Lord had taught him in reading through the scriptures. And it's almost as if at this time now the light comes on for James. It's been there all the time, I just didn't see it. How many of you can testify that that's how we are in the reading of scripture? I knew that there are portions of Scripture that deal with Christ. I just didn't know it's all about him. And when the Lord turns that light on, when you start reading Old Testament new, no matter what, your eyes are looking for him and what it has to say about him. But if you go back there, here James is quoting this. He says, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins of Thereof, and I will set it up. So a Jew reading that, saying, ah, here comes the earthly kingdom, just like many today. They still have not understood the scriptures. They think that there's still some part of prophecy, and they'll quote even Amos to say, God's going to reestablish the Jewish nation. He's going to build up again that tabernacle of David, and he's going to honor his promises to that Jewish nation. Well, guess what? In quoting this particular scripture, James, is not talking about building up again a natural or national tabernacle of David. It says there in verse 17 that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. So in the building up again of this tabernacle of David, he's not talking about a Jewish kingdom. 
but he's talking about one in which the Gentiles are brought in to call upon the name of the Lord. Saith the Lord who doeth all these things. When you ask yourself, well, when did he build again the tabernacle of David? He built it again when he caused his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into this world. Men just didn't realize it. That's why the Lord said to them, destroy this temple, three days I'll build it again. They didn't realize he was talking about his body. The tabernacle of David, where you see that word tabernacle, that was with reference to that Old Testament tabernacle on which God caused his glory to, to shine. The presence of the Lord was there. Well, what do we read in John chapter 1? That God, the word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacle. And John said, we beheld his glory. That's that Shekinah glory. As of the only begotten of Son of God. Only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. And so they didn't realize it, but it's as if now James, the lights come on. Oh, that is the tabernacle. And it's not just for Jewish believers. Here, when he says in verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. How many times have you read in the Old Testament prophets about a highway being built to Jerusalem and that all nations coming to worship there? There are a lot of preachers that say, well, that's yet to come. That's going to be in a thousand year reign. All of a sudden, Jerusalem's going to be back in prominence. And well, that prophecy will be fulfilled. But they read the scriptures blindly because that highway of holiness has already been built in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That tabernacle where God has caused his name to dwell, it's in this person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all those nations that come to him, that's what it's about, coming to him, are accepted because it's the Lord who has chosen them and is calling them. But if you go back there to Amos chapter 9. You'll see this written there. If you have trouble finding Amos, just start from Malachi and go back until you see Obadiah and then Amos. Chapter 9. Notice in verse 11. This is what James was quoted. In that day will I raise up not just a tabernacle, but the tabernacle of David. This is that promised seed that God made to David that for a time, seemed like would never occur. That there would never be one raised up to sit upon his throne. But And here it was still forward-looking because Christ had not yet come. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made of a law, that he might redeem those that run the law. And it, here's the prophecy, the promise by Amos. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle, the tabernacle of David, that is falling, and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. But how did he build it? It's a spiritual building. This is the church of which Paul would write later in Ephesians chapter 2, laid upon that foundation of Christ. We're not to look for any other tabernacle. We're not to look for any other building. Like so many today, they still think that... Before this is all said and done, there's going to be a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Do you see how blasphemous that is? It's as if to say that the work of Christ was not sufficient. Now we've got to go back to the old to build it again. Verse 12 says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen. Edom, that was the nation that came out of Cain. And you say, well, I thought that Cain was... Cast off he was, but still there is a remnant according to the election of grace, not just among the Jews. Otherwise, there would have been no hope for Rahab. There would have been no hope for Ruth, the Moabites. Everything stood against her in the law, and yet God ordained that she should be of that remnant, just like any one of us. And so this is the foundation upon which James made his declaration, not based on any personal relationship himself with the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Word of God. We do well to stick with the Word of God. Sometimes we get thinking that somehow I'm just going to tell my testimony and that's what the Lord's going to do. Nope. 
if God ever converts a heart, it's going to be through the word. It's not because so-and-so said so. It's going to be through the word. And so James declares that based upon the word. He remembered that the Judaism of his day had fallen down in a sense that Christ had been rejected. He came unto his own, his own received him not. That's what he was talking about. But now God was in the business of rebuilding the true work of his son. And that was focused on a church. The word church means called out ones, where Christ said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. But guess what? That church is made up of Jew and Gentile. Many are preaching today as if there's still two people of God. They say, well, the Jews were, but now they didn't believe, so now God's working with the Gentiles. But one day's coming when he's going to go back to the Jews again. That's a schizophrenic God. One day this, one day that. No. There's one people, one Lord, one Master, one Redeemer, one substitution, one satisfaction. And it's in that that God is raising up that tabernacle even though all else has fallen down. And that's why it says all the Gentiles, you see that in verse 17, <clears throat> upon whom my name is called. There again, to call on the name of the Lord isn't making some little profession of faith, walking an aisle saying a prayer. To call on him, his name is to worship him in this one way, Jew or Gentile. We're not to try to make people like ourselves. We're to point them to Christ. And God does the saving. When God said there were Gentiles who were called by his name, he said they stay Gentiles. See, even there we tend to, well, that doesn't look like a believer ought to walk. Well, how does a believer walk? We don't even all walk the same. But we have life physically. There's a sign that we're alive. Well, spiritually, the same thing. These are not Gentiles who have been made Jews. I fear that many today, their profession of faith is that they have been made Jews. They've been made proselytes. People are concerned. They walk into a building and the preacher says, well, here, let me take you through the ABCs. And if you really want to have assurance of your salvation, then these are the things you need to do. That's just like they were doing with these Gentiles. You got to get circumcised and then you got to learn to pour up and you got to be able to memorize scripture. So they get people acting like they are, but that's not salvation. Here, there's a clear indication that Gentiles do not need to become Jews and come under the law to become right with God, nor does anybody. It's in through and by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And so that's why he says there. Therefore, I judge. You see, saith the Lord who doeth all these things, that this residue of men might seek the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. That's why Peter said we shouldn't trouble these among the Gentiles, as if somehow there are some requirements in addition to the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a lot of troublers today. They're going to tell you that the message of grace alone and the work of Christ alone isn't sufficient. You've got to also. When you hear that, plug your ears and run for your life. It's like they say, if the government shows up at your door, says, I'm here to help you, run. If these folks show up at your door and tell you, it's all right, you can believe what you believe, but you're going to have to run for your life because those are enemies of the truth. And so we're going to look at the rest of this next time, Lord willing, but verse 18 sums it up. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. That goes all the way back to the fall. There's only been one message that God has ever communicated to a fallen world, and that is the hope of salvation. In the Old Testament, it was forward-looking. They were given that grace by the Spirit of God to look to this one who should come. Jew and Gentile. And since the cross, we look back. But known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He knows those that are his. He knows those that he purposed to save from eternity. He knows each one for whom Christ paid the debt. And he's going to have every one of them. It's just that we find out. But let's not be judges ourselves to look over here at this one thing. Well, they're, 
reprobate her. Now think about what our lot was before it pleased God to reveal Christ. Now, we were of that number. Same thing. But God was pleased to deliver us and save us. That's in verse 19. He said, wherefore my sentence is, this I judge, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Don't add anything other than it's by the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ alone. All right. Deep waters. Pray, pray the Lord will bless it to our hearing.